you've come to the right place. If you're a course creator looking to build more impact, income, and freedom, LMS Cast is the number one podcast for course creators just like you. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I'm the co-founder of the most powerful tool for building, selling, and protecting engaging online courses called Lifter LMS. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of LMS Cast. My name's Chris Badgett and we're joined by a special guest, Kevin Geary from digitalambition.co. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. I'm really excited to get in with get in it with you because I help entrepreneurs, you help entrepreneurs build uh, profitable digital businesses, online businesses. Uh, for me, it's specifically in the course space. You also have a journey as a course creator, someone who's created a membership. So there's like your kind of case study and your journey, what worked for, for you. When did, you said it started in 2013, is that right? Yeah, my first, uh, my first working online business started in 2013, and that was the online business that allowed me to, to go full-time online. What were you doing before you became an online entrepreneur? So I was the co-owner in a martial arts studio here in Atlanta uh, that opened in 2018. I was the manager of a martial arts studio before that. Um, so that was kind of like the very beginning of my entrepreneurial journey, running a brick and mortar uh, studio. And um, in 2012-ish, I really started to just not like that industry much anymore. Um, the partnership that I was in wasn't going that great. I was already starting to kind of like, my first daughter was born in 2012. And so I kind of had what I felt at the time was like a soul sucking day job at that point. Like I just despised getting up every day and having to go back into that studio and that environment uh, and that situation. I started looking at different avenues. I had had experience in the online space before that doing blogging and things like that. I'd been designing websites for a long time uh, just for myself, not like as a business or anything. So um, I had tools and I decided at that point, like, all right, well, if I'm going to kind of jump ship, I loved the idea of location independence and schedule independence. And I was like, well, let's, let's go online, like really hard and see if we can make this thing actually work. This idea, this concept of online business. So, uh, 2013 is when we launched, uh, that was like in January of 2013, August, 2013, I left that job and the rest is history. That's awesome. And was that uh, your health related online business? Yes. Yeah. Was martial, was martial arts like kind of the bridge to the health focus? Cause I know martial arts has a lot of, you know, inner game and health. It does. Stuff. Yeah. No, but that, that wasn't uh, the bridge. The bridge was my own personal health journey. So um, when I, when I switched into teaching in, in martial arts, I was so busy on the teaching side of things that I actually stopped practicing right for a while. Wow. And I gained a lot of weight. Uh, I didn't have like a good diet and good eating. So when I stopped the actual training side of it, uh, I was just doing teaching and I was doing coaching. We had a uh, national competition team. So I was traveling around doing that. Uh, so the, all of that took my time. I stopped training as much as I was, gained a lot of weight. Uh, and all throughout my life, I was like up and down with weight. Um, I had to watch my weight like very carefully. Um, and, you know, and I think it was, you know, 2009-ish, I was, uh, you know, basically 35, 40 pounds overweight. At that time, I went to get a physical. They said, you have high blood pressure, you're a borderline diabetic, like you need to get in control of this stuff, right? And so I started, you know, making a move towards that. And I thankfully, I went online, I found like the real food movement, you know, where, where it was like, hey, just eat real food, like stop doing all the dieting and the Weight Watchers stuff that I had been doing in the past. Uh, I started doing that started doing more like functional fitness instead of like going to the gym and reading a piece of paper and doing sets and this and that. I just started doing like more natural stuff. Like I just went out and walked. I played tennis. I like did stuff that was fun. And I actually lost like all of the weight fairly easily just following the real food, functional fitness kind of stuff. And uh, at the martial arts studio where I was teaching uh, all of the students, mostly were kids, the parents were like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you just you know, lost all this weight. Like, right. you look fantastic. Like, what are you doing? And so I started telling them, sharing with them. They asked me, hey, can, like, can you like put some structure to this so we can like follow it? Started to do that. 
Um, they started following it. They started getting amazing results. And at the time I was like, all right, well, you know, maybe this is the thing. Like I, I love doing this. I love seeing what it's doing for other people. Uh, maybe we should take this. This should be the online thing. We should try to bring this into the online space. And that's what I did. That's awesome. Can you just elaborate a little more on functional fitness? What does that mean? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, ways that people go about the idea of functional fitness. Some are just like it's activities, right? Out in the world, like sports is a perfect example of functional fitness. Uh, it's but not then isolated people, movements in the gym. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Like, but other people do take it into like the weight room. And so they would design, you know, weightlifting routines that are more functional. You know, it's like somebody would consider like a deadlift to be more functional than a bicep curl or something. So there's different definitions of it. But for me, it was um, out in the world, out in the environment and stuff that translates to the real world. Like, yeah, all those isolated, you know, weightlifting exercises you see people doing with dumbbells don't really translate to your daily movement and, and uh, you know, any athleticism or anything like that. Very cool. So what kind of like, what'd you create? What was the online business for in this niche? Like, what was it? Was it a course? Was it a membership? Was there you know, yeah. an ebook? What was it? Yeah, no, it was a course. Uh, okay. Right off the bat, I, I went into the online course space and probably made one of the biggest mistakes in doing that is that I tried to make this giant six month <laughs> online course program that covered everything, right? It was like the, everything that people wanted to know and was asking me, that was what went into the course, right? Uh, and it was, it had structure and it had like, you know, all right, we're going to do this step first, then this step, and then this step. Um, and I had another coach that I brought in to help with all of that. And, uh, you know, we, we launched it incorrectly, um, where like the very first time I put it out, I let people buy, like, so it was like six stages, right? And I let people buy individual stages instead of just buying the entire course. Like that was the yeah. original way and then figured out very quickly, all right, that's not going to work. And then packaged it all into one and just slowly but surely did it at the wrong price points. It was like a, a mit, tremendously cheap, right? Um, I think it was the, the payment plan was like six payments of $9 was the very first like, okay. like, offer of it, right? This is a course, by the way, that ended up selling for $695 at some point. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can see the vast difference in like, all right, here's where we started and here's where we got to. Um, but that stayed, you know, the flagship, uh, you know, product for a while. We ended up calling it back from a six month to a 90 day course to make it a lot more digestible and approachable for a lot of people. Uh, and in doing that, it became simpler and easier to follow. And then we got uh, feedback from people going through it on how to make it better and how to get people better results. And it just was in constant development and kind of restructuring and we relaunched it multiple times. Uh, but that was like one of the main things that we offered. That's awesome. I just want to highlight how you went back through it. You kept adjusting things. You kept, you didn't just walk away and be like, this isn't working. And you, no. <laughs> you just kept changing it, like testing assumptions. I think that's really smart. Yep. What that now you offer a, a membership at digitalambition.co where you help online business owners, people grow or get started. So this is the other niche you're in, which is the, mm -hmm. the online entrepreneurship niche. How do you help those people? Yeah, so I, I bring them into a membership community environment. Basically, what I wished I had been in when I was going through this the first time and, and really the second time, and then all the times I failed before that would have been nice to be in something like this as well. Um, but it, it's kind of like, uh, and I found this for myself and almost all of the online entrepreneurs that I talk to, uh, a lot of people want to sell like a recipe. You know, they have yeah. their email marketing recipe or their Facebook ads recipe or this and that. And as for me as an online entrepreneur, most people that I work with and talk to, they want like somebody who, who kind of has a cookbook, right? Where it's like, right. you come in, you look like, look at my business. Here's what's going on in my business. Here's what I feel is going wrong. Here's what I feel is going right. What do you think I should do next? What do you, all of you think I should do next, right? And it's, so it's not like a come learn this, come learn that. It's more like a come look at what I'm doing. Give me that feedback and advice based on your experience and then help me execute on that and make sure that I'm executing correctly. Um, you've probably experienced the same thing. And it's not that online courses can't have this component. They certainly do and probably should. But somebody can learn something in an online course and they can learn the exact right thing that they need to do for their business 
and go off and just be terrible at execution. And then it fails. And then what do they yeah. say? Hey, that thing you taught me doesn't work or that thing you told me to do doesn't work. It's like, no, it's the execution that went wrong, not the idea, not, not the strategy or the tactic, right? So being in a membership community where we're constantly, in, and I've tried to build a membership community in a different way than the other ones that I see available out there where a lot of people want to make membership communities centered around come learn things. Like here's, here's all the trainings that we are. Come do our trainings library. And we bring guest experts in to do all of this training. And our pitch is more like, come in and let us look at your business. Come in and let us uh, hear what you have to say about what's working and what's not working and what we think you should do next. So it's more about that like personalization and getting you that guidance, that personalized guidance and support that you really want. Like that person looking over your shoulder saying, all right, I see your sales page. Here's what I would recommend that you change. Here's what you did really well. Here's what's missing. Here's this landing page. Here's why it's probably not working. Here's why that Facebook ad might not be working, right? And making those adjustments and pivots just as I did. Uh, but of course, the figuring it out all on your own method is very costly. <laughs> and uh, in both time and, and money. I love this. So I like when I see somebody who's making an online training program, I'm always asking like what's in the stack and, you, and the most successful ones are not just courses. It's not just the training library. And I'm just looking inside what you're offering here is you have the premium training library, but you also have checklists, cheat sheets, and more, a helpful community, weekly hot seat calls, and uh, the hive, which is like your own kind of news portal. Um, like just like what's going on or that's what you call it. You call like it a community feed. Yeah. Like the community feed. Um, okay. so, the, the so like we, what's new is it's like a alert it's, of what's it's, new. It's what's new. It's, um, all of people's posts, you know, people, so you can, you can come on to like the hot seat calls, for example, and you get to sit in the hot seat and you get to choose one thing. We don't go over everything. You get to choose one thing that you want to focus on in your business. You tell us what that is. And then we get, it's, it's just like a mastermind, but you get to be in the hot seat every single week, basically. It's a, it's a smaller condensed time slot, but yeah. you get to be there every day and, or every week and you get to focus on your specific business. So it's not like a mastermind in the, in the sense that you have to show up and also give advice to everybody. It's, it's just me, right? So you show up, everybody gets their time slot and we hit, we, we go hard in the paint on that one thing. And then you take the advice and you go execute it. And then if you want to focus on something else, guess what? You come back next week to focus on something else. We don't go like, here's this and then that, and then that. And I give you this giant checklist of to do stuff, dumping it on your plate. We pick one thing to fix or to go after, and then you execute on that and then come back. Now that's with me, right? We also have the community feed. If you want feedback from everybody in the hive, then you go to the community feed, you post. Hey guys, I just made this new landing page. I just made this new Facebook ad. I just made this new sales page. Please go take a look at it. Let me know what you think, what's missing, what needs to be changed, what's not clear. And you can get general feedback and advice from the community that way. Wow, that's awesome. And what is the... Uh the checklist, cheat sheets, cheat sheets, and more like, so these are like extra resources, which are, which are awesome because they can, um, they can take big ideas and actually give you an execution plan or help you like take big idea and break it out into something that you can actually use. Like what, what, what are some example checklists and cheat sheets you have? Yeah, there's actually two of them that you can get for free. Two of the major ones that I offer, you can get for free and I give them away for free because I want people to see what the thought process is like and what the, uh, the kind of resources that we develop are, knowing full and well that if you download one of these, it's, you can't really sit there and do it on your own. Like you have to have guidance or feedback on it or parts of it explained to you. Uh, one is called the One Page Freedom Plan. And uh, so that's available for free on the site. And that's a cheat sheet. Uh, it's like a one page business plan that basically outlines everything that's super important to uh, keep focus on for your online business. I have another one that's called uh, How to Sell Anything Online. This is a multi-page, almost like a workbook, and you can just go down uh, item by item, and it's basically asking questions about um, you know, things that your prospect is thinking about or needs to know, um, things that they hate, 
things that they desire, and it just goes down. So if you're saying, all right, I have this new online course. How am I going to write emails to sell it? How am I going to write Facebook ads to sell it? How am I going to create a freebie to get people in the door for it? This workbook answers all of those questions and answers it in a way where when you're writing, you can take what you're writing and instantly insert it into a Facebook ad or an email or whatever you happen to be doing to promote this thing. And again, people can have that for free. A lot of it they can probably do on their own. But in order to do it effectively, it's really helpful to have somebody who has done it before, and knows what they're doing to say, hey, is this the, am I writing the right stuff down, right? Am I, am I using this stuff in the right way? So people can have that for free if they want. If they want the guidance to go along with it, obviously that's available to them as well, like in the hive. That's awesome. And if you go to digitalambition.co forward slash freedom dash plan, you can get that. I'm not quite sure where on your website to get the, the workbook. Um, so that can, I'll send you a link to it. Um, I don't have that one publicly. I have a video, uh, on my YouTube called how to sell anything online. And then the cheat sheet is attached to that. I cool. did that more as like a content upgrade instead of like a global freebie opt-in kind of thing. What's your YouTube channel called? Uh, so digital ambition. And that one's fairly recently. I actually announced like just a, a couple months ago, I said, guys, I'm going hard in the paint on YouTube for the rest of the year. Um, so that's a pretty much a brand new channel. Uh, but there's some really uh, good stuff there for people. Awesome. So you've gone from zero to over 1 million in online course sales across two different niches. So the health and the digital entrepreneurship. Um, what's something that you, that kind of got you to escape velocity from the, uh, uh, the martial arts job that you didn't want to stay at, I believe, or did you just say, I'm just out of here anyways and I'm going to cut off my resources and no, I just can't take no, no. anymore. Which no, I definitely didn't do that. I definitely okay. didn't do that because I had, like I said, my first daughter had just been born. Um, my, yeah. my wife's a stay at home mom. Uh, yeah. so I, I was it right. Like I'm, I'm the money coming in. So you had to reduce risk. I did. I did. And so, yeah. um, I, when I say I started the business in 2013, that was the official launch of the online business. Now for being honest, um, all through 2012, while sitting, you know, in my, so I, I have some assistant instructors who can teach class. Like every time I go back to the office while they take over the warm up or the cool down, right? Yeah. I'm in there <laughs> pounding away on the keyboard, getting uh, blog posts written or stuff uh, outlined that I'm going to have for this online business. And we started developing the website behind the scenes. And so a lot of the prep work was, it's not like I just launched in 2013 and boom, we're, we're like, traction and momentum and all that stuff. Right. There was like six solid months of preparing to launch the website for this thing that was going on behind the scenes. Um, so I was doing that all through 2012 and then 2013 starts. So I have my full time, you know, income from the quote unquote day job where I'm a co-owner, but it really feels like a job. And uh, so I've got that. That's nice and secure. Launched the website. It wasn't until April where we really got the first version of the online course kind of ready to go. Like I said, the pricing was all wrong there, but people were buying, right? I had a podcast. I had uh, a lot of blog articles um, that by April, so January we were started publishing, right? By April, a few of them started to rank and just bring in some organic traffic. And it was just random, like a sale comes through at nine bucks. Somebody agreed to make six payments of $9. And then the next right. week, a sale came through. And I go look at the analytics. I see, hey, it's coming from some articles. There's podcast downloads happening. And so I knew like, all right, people are buying it at $9. Now, I obviously, I you know do a little math and I'm like, this is going to take forever at $9. Yeah. And so, and I, and I start to feel like this is worth a lot more than nine dollars and so we go from nine to 19 and then we went from 19 to 29 and we went from 29 to 39 and 39 to 49 it went up to like 59 dollars uh six payments of 59 dollars and because every time i raised it nothing happened no the sales didn't go they just kept coming in every time i raised the price and so we got the traction and momentum that way just kind of building and uh, th those were pretty quick, you know, like I would change it from 29 to 39 after like two weeks. Like when I went from 19 to 29 and nothing happened, I was like, cool, let's just go to 39. And so that all kind of happened fairly quickly. And of course, with the recurring payments, they do cut off at the six month mark, which kind of sucked. Um, but it did give pretty consistent revenue each month. Our churn rate was very low. 
Um, there were not a lot of cancellations. We did get a lot of cancellations when I tested out a trial period uh, for those out there listening. If they're you know wondering, should I do a trial for my thing? Um, we did see a huge, we, we tried like a $1 trial for that. Um, and it works, you know, in, in certain niches, I think that's perfect. And for certain products and things like that, it's, it's a great thing to try. It just wasn't a good fit for us. Um, we got a lot of people in the door just wanted to poke around and like, Hey, let's just see what's going on here. They had no intention of doing the work and getting results or anything like that. So it's kind of a, just a distraction for us. So we took that away. Um, but I got to a point where I was comfortable, like with the direction, everything was headed and I had more ideas for products and services on the table and I was so fed up and I, it was a big risk, but I took it and you know, it worked out. I'm not saying that people should take that risk. I feel like the, the boat was coming into the dock. It wasn't quite there. I kind of yeah. left off and swam as hard as I could to uh -huh. it. Uh, but you know, it worked out. So in Japanese and Japanese culture, there's a the concept of Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. What I, I see some people have it and some people don't. What is it about your situation that gave you the motivation to keep tweaking, to change the prices, to change the offer, to change this value stack of, in the program? Like, why did you keep working it? I, I mean, part of it is just having my back against the wall. Like, <laughs> there wasn't any other option. Like, I couldn't sit there and keep watching a $9 sale roll in. Like, that's, you know, it's not going to pay the bill. It's not going to get me to where I want to go, right? Uh, and I had, it's not like I was inexperienced in entrepreneurship, right? I was running a martial arts studio. I was doing all the marketing for our martial arts studio. I was doing the yeah. online marketing for our martial arts studio. I was selling membership every single day. People, you know, a lot of people struggle with the online space because they've never sold anything before. They've yeah. never promoted anything any, uh, before. But you did that brick and mortar. Yeah. So pe every day I was on the phone with people closing deals. I was <laughs> selling out tournaments. I was like getting people into our, our, uh, our tournaments. Uh, what, what does a martial arts membership cost per month? Uh, so we were selling at that time 139 149 a month. Yeah. I mean, that's substantial. You yeah. know, one, one sale and that's, that's a lot of money. Yeah. If, and and if they you know, stick right pays. Up. Yeah, prepays for that, you know, uh, 1200 bucks for the year and whatnot. Uh, if they have family members, I mean, some of those deals were 3500 bucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, that's huge. Yeah, so it's not like, you know, selling little ebooks and stuff like that, right? And it's, you know, I was super comfortable getting on the phone with people. You know, I started back when I was uh, 18 is when I started my first go at a, at a business. It was a mobile bartending service. Yeah. And it completely failed because I made myself the salesperson and I had no idea what I was doing. And I didn't even want to get on the phone with people. Like I was trying to just sell all the deals through email. Like I didn't, yeah. people were like, can you give me a call? I'm like, no, I don't know what that's about. I don't call people. We're going to do this through email. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, that needless to say, that business didn't go well. Um, but that's what happens to so many people, right? Cause yeah. they don't have experience. Like I don't want to get on camera. I don't want to be on YouTube. I don't want my voice to be out there. I don't want to be on a podcast. There's so much of that stuff that prevents people from being successful just cause they're afraid of it. And you know, I went through a lot of that, but by the time I did the martial arts thing and then I, I was ready for this online business, like I, there wasn't really anything holding me back at that point. That's great. Now, you mentioned you admitted a mistake of making like what we call on this channel, a giant course. And yes. then you dialed it back to something we recommend, which is a 12 week program. You call you said 90 days. So three month program. Mm -hmm. How did you take like this library of information that's huge and think more about like week one, week two, like how did you, how did you make that transition? Well, I mean, first, first of all, I, I did an audit of it and I realized like, you know, when I was first building this thing, it, it, like some of the stuff sounded good and felt like it needed to be there. But once you watched people go through it and you started talking to people, I mean, it's, it was as simple as like, let's just take one stage, like stage three or something like each stage had eight or nine different modules in it. Right. Yeah. Which is, I don't design any of the trainings I do anymore like that. I pretty much do like three parts, like it's three parts. And then that's, that's a, a core thing. And then we're going to move on to the next one, right? This had like eight or nine different things. And you know, one of the pieces of feedback we got a lot of times was, um, I'm having trouble like knowing where I'm at in the, in the course and the program and what to do next or the checklists are too long and on and on and on. But yeah. through a conversation, people will tell you, Hey, module two, like 
I, I just skipped it. I don't even pay attention to it. And when so many people tell you that over and over and over again, it's like, all right, we'll just take that module out, right? It's not, it's not, obviously it's not necessary. Right. Um, and so you just watch a bunch of people go through it. And, you know, even though I was selling it at the wrong price, I was kind of thankful because it was getting a lot of people in the door. And a lot of those people turned into good testimonials and really good feedback for what needed to change in the program. And so we just started with what are people telling us if they're not liking X, Y, Z, or they're not even using it, let's just take it out. And, um, you know, we, we took a simpler is better approach. And then that became, it's funny because, you know, in marketing, uh, the same situation can have really good pros and, and really good cons. And it's just what you decide to focus on, right? When it was a big six month program, we marketed it as, look, this stuff's not easy. It's going to take time. Like that's why you need a giant program like this. And then when it was stripped down, it became, Hey, this is the, you know, we've learned over time. Here's the most efficient way to get you from point A to point B. I still think there's a, a probably a good selling point for we're going to make a year long course and I want you to commit to this thing and I want you to pay a really solid sizable amount for it and you're going to stick with it, right? Because we're structuring it that way. But then again, there's also a really good selling point for why something should be 60 or 90 days to get people quick wins and get their momentum and traction going. You can do it either way, um, but the 60 to 90 day thing is far easier from a business standpoint to, I think, promote, to build, to sell. That is awesome. You mentioned you're doubling down on YouTube. Why? Yes. So YouTube for me is, it's a, when I look at the channel and how it's used in particular, um, in the health space, like it was just talking, a lot of talking to camera, right? And I, I feel like that's not quite as good. I mean, you could probably find ways to make it more interesting and stuff. But with what I do now, uh, I do a lot of screen sharing stuff. I do a lot of tutorial based stuff. And so video just makes a lot of sense. But from a standpoint of marketing, when I look at how people are using channels, the two that I love the most are podcasting and YouTube. And the reason is when somebody discovers your YouTube channel, the same is true with your podcast. They, a high percentage of them, dive in deep. They will go watch lots of your videos. They will go you know, download the last 15 podcast episodes you did and sit there and binge listen to them, right? Yeah. Not only are you in their ear, as well as in their eyeballs with YouTube. Uh, and then, you know, your content is, is getting into them the same way it would through a blog post. But you have all of these different channels that you're hitting on, like the ear, the eye, the brain, everything is engaged. And what I found is that people just build that no like, and trust way faster, you know? And it's, it's completely different. Like, I don't think there's anybody, at least I haven't met them, that'll read a blog post and go, great, I'm gonna sit here and read the next 15 blog posts that you have, especially mine when they're like 2,500 words long, you know, you can't just have that kind of attention from people, but they'll gladly do that with a podcast. They'll gladly do that with a YouTube channel. And so if those things aren't there, you're missing out on those like people who will be super fans and just binge all of your stuff and then be like, all right, where do I buy? Cause they just listened to hours of your content. That's great. So how do you stand out in a crowded niche? Helping somebody start and grow an online business is a crowded niche, but there's yeah. only one you. Yes. And you know, there's all, you probably have your specific type of person or tribe that you work with. Can you give us some insight into how you, how do you stand out in a crowded market? And, um, just so people who are faced with the same thing. And I mean, crowded markets aren't necessarily a bad thing either, but how do you approach yeah. that challenge? Yeah, uh, there's a few different ways. I mean, first of all, I, I present myself as a normal, uh, everyday guy, like person, right? Um, you can go to my Instagram and you're going to see my family. You're going to see, I've got three kids um, and I, I do the daily like family grind, right? And so one of the things is, is like you don't have to be a 22-year-old single high-driven entrepreneurial guy to like succeed at this stuff, right? If you've got three kids and you feel like you don't have any time, you know, I'm for you, right? Because I'm going to show you how to win in that kind of environment. Um, so that's one, you know, just presenting myself that way, which is just the real me. That's, that's what I am, you know, is, is a dad that's an entrepreneur and that feeds his family through the internet. The second thing is I, I like to tell people the truth about 
the hard, the hard work that it's going to take. Um, I like to tell people the truth about the ups and downs and the pivots and adjustments. And instead of presenting this like, here's your blueprint, you're going to go from point A to point B in a perfectly straight line and just follow me and pay me. And that's what's going to happen. Um, so there's, there's that, you know, just not like, you know, sugarcoating everything for people. Uh, and then, you know, the third thing I think is the size and the scope. I'm not telling people, look, come here and I'm going to have you build a multi-million dollar online empire. I'm going to get you location freedom. I'm going to get you schedule freedom. Uh, you're not going to be living paycheck to paycheck. You're going to be doing pretty well for yourself. And you're going to love life a lot more because I'm going to give you balance as well as uh, an escape from, you know, this day job or whatever it is that, that you're struggling with. And if you're already decided, hey, I'm going to be an online entrepreneur and you're struggling, I'm going to come in and make this business simpler and more profitable for you. Like I hate the idea of building this giant complex online business. Again, trying to build like a high risk online empire type mm -hmm. thing. This is not my thing. Like I just want to be happy. I want to be able to travel when I want to travel. I want to live where I want to live. I don't want to need anybody's permission for anything. I just want to be independent and I want to do that through online business. And that's what I help other people do, whether they haven't started yet or they already have started. That's great. How do you deal with the two market challenge of helping beginners and like people start and helping people grow? Like, is there an advantage to serving both or how no. do you, how do you help them? <laughs> What? No, I no, I struggle. I struggle to serve both. I I shouldn't serve both. If I if I was giving myself advice, I would say stop serving the people who are sitting on the sidelines who are, you know, they want that life and they they want to maybe pursue this. Stop paying attention to them. Stop helping people start online businesses. That's very difficult, right? It's much easier for me. One area that I focused on is bloggers, for example. Because I noticed that bloggers specifically, um, they, you know, they, they're into this like make money online world. That's why a lot of them got into blogging and they think blogging is my business. Like they're, they're trying to turn a channel into an entire business and they've got ads all over their site and little ebook products and they're just working their face off, right? And I found it very easy to bring those kinds of people in and just make some tweaks and adjustments to their business and they go from blogging to having an actual business and they have a lot more free time and they love life and boom, like it flourishes, you know? Um, that's much easier for me than taking somebody who's like, oh, I've got three ideas, which one's gonna be profitable? How do I build a website? Like all that stuff, right? However, when I look at like legacy and I look at like impact, the idea of taking somebody from where I was, like this soul-sucking day job, you've got kids to feed, you hate your life, there's no reason why you're doing what you're doing, there's so much opportunity online, taking a person like that and actually helping them succeed and helping them make the transition successfully, it, I don't think there is any bigger impact that you can make. And so I have made a bad business decision in helping them in order to make what I think is the right decision in, in general, because I have the skills that can help them. And so I shouldn't just cut them off because it would be easier to do so. I really admire you for that. Yeah. That's an interesting challenge to, um, you know, help beginners and intermediates at the same time, but you know, not giving those beginners a chance when you can help them, when you can throw them a lifeline, uh, it's, you know, there's, there's an ethical or moral question there, maybe. I don't know if those are the right words for it, but if you can help them, why not? I think the challenge is we have to figure out how to help them in a more scalable way. Right. Um, or, you know, there's always like tiers and packages and, you know, so more passive versus more active. Like your hot seats, I want to go back to you for a second. Yeah. So if I'm a customer, I just want to make sure I understand. Does Everybody who's in your, who's as an active membership have the chance to come to the same hot seat call, which happens once a week. Is that how it works? So we use an RSVP format. So I actually do multiple calls, um, but we do an RSVP format. So the call schedules that's, are posted. That, that's why I wanted to ask you because yeah. it sounded like if I show up, it's just me being on the hot seat. No, no, there's other okay. people. And this is the, this is the thing too. There's a lot of people that they want to show up. They don't have anything to talk about. Like they already have what they need to be focused on in their business. They're already executing. And until they finish that, they don't really need more. Right. Yeah. And, but they want to show up to listen because what a lot of people have told me is like, they just get tremendous value out of hearing other people get advice. 
Yeah. And so depending on the hot seat call, we might have six uh, seats available for the actual hot seats. And those will be like 10 minute seats each. We can do one where the format is uh, more like a blitz format where everybody gets a five minute spot and we can do more people on the same call. I do have a gold membership where um, people pay a lot more. They get Voxer access to me. They also get a, a completely separate hot seat call with much longer time slots, much fewer people on the call. Um, so that is an option as like an upgrade. I don't like that's not available on the front end. You already have to be in to, to do that. Um, that's another way we work on the scale. But yeah, like the call schedule is posted and it's first come first serve as far as RSVPs go. So the system we use is puts everybody in order by when they RSVP. And so the first six people know I'm getting in, right? And the people that just want to show up and listen, don't RSVP. They just show up and they just listen. So they're not on the list, right? So everybody can see who's RSVP for this call and that call. They know if they're going to get a spot or not. Uh, and it's very simple and easy to use. So, you know, people are getting, and my goal is for, not for them to get on every single week, you know, because like if you're just getting on so we can talk more, right, when you should be executing, that's not helpful to you or me or anybody else, right? So every, there's a culture that we've established where people understand like how this works and what's best for everybody and what's best for them and their business. How else does your program help with uh, helping people execute and implement and not just get into information consumption mode. Like how do you, how do you help people overcome that challenge? Yeah. So for example, the two things, and just to explain more of the hot seat calls, we're not just talking, right? So we do on zoom, right? Like right we are now. And so I pull up people's sales pages on the screen and we go yeah. through it, right? I pull up their freebie. I pull up their Facebook ads account, all of this stuff. And so we dive into the actual execution of it on the call. It's not just like, here's what I think you should do and blah, blah, blah. We just talk, right? Uh, which also is, you know, I've been in masterminds before, much more beneficial, I think, than just being in a mastermind where everybody's talking at you and, and to you and things like that. Like, there's only so much that can be discussed. At some point, we actually have to look at what's going on, right? Um, so there's that. And then the training side of things, I make it very clear to people when they sign up, do not, like this trainings library is not for you to just go browse around in or poke around in or tell yourself stories about how you're being super awesome and super productive by learning all of these new things. I pretty much tell them to stay out of it. I, I say, come to the, the, the uh, hot seat calls. Let's look at your business. Let's look at what needs to happen. If there's something you're missing that you need a training for, I'll tell you where to go get it or I'll tell you what module to go look in. But this isn't for you to just poke around and consume all of your time learning new things, right? If you ask for feedback and the whole you know, community decides, hey, dude, this is the direction you need to go in. You need to get the Facebook ads fired up on this thing. You need this, you know, you need traffic and you need it right now. We got to see if this thing's working. And you're like, I don't know how to do Facebook ads. Cool, there's a training for that. Go do it. And so you're directed at the trainings you should do. It's not just come in and learn and learn and learn. Awesome. Thank you for that. I think that's super valuable. And especially for people that do end up creating a big course or a membership with lots of training, really good coaches will help direct you to like the components you need in what order. That's like the, a super valuable skill and what makes the difference between a great membership and one that ends up being a little bit overwhelming. Yeah, it's super important. I mean, because if you leave people to their own devices, I mean, they will. They're like, well, he put this training library here. I'm, I better do it all, you know? And then they yeah. haven't done anything on their business. So, super important. So, I was just checking out your podcast, Digital Ambition, and you're over 100 episodes. As of this recording, you're at like 120 episodes. Mm -hmm. Why podcasting and how has it affected your business uh, so podcasting is, I think, my most natural way to create content. So it's the easiest for me. Um, writing used to be, but I've, I've gotten very uh, kind of tired out on writing. Um, so podcasting was the next easiest channel for me, plus what we talked about earlier as far as uh, people binge listening and then just the data on people telling me when they sign up, it was your podcast, it was your podcast, it was your podcast, yeah. it was your podcast, right? So That's what you're hearing? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The podcast is a really good job at just building the no like, and trust and then converting people into uh, the membership or uh, I do group programs as well. So sometimes we'll convert into those really well from a podcast. And then 
the reason I said, you know, I'm going hard in the paint on YouTube is, and I told my podcast audience this as well and, and my email list, uh, YouTube was on the docket for a while, but I wanted to get the podcast a certain level of traction and momentum before dividing my attention because YouTube for me is not nearly as easy. Um, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot more setup involved. I'm a perfectionist that I'm, I'm constantly battling perfectionism and how the video quality is and how the videos are going to work and all this nonsense, right? That really doesn't need to be there, but it's there for me. So, um, YouTube is a harder channel. I kind of put it on the back burner. Now I feel like, all right, I, I have the resources to focus on it. So might as well do it. So some people, uh, just take the same, they take their podcast and they put it on YouTube kind of like we're doing with this podcast right here. Mm, yeah. But sometimes people, and this is, you know, I have a software company is different from having a course and coaching company, but how, how are you approaching YouTube differently from podcasts or are you, are you repurposing podcasts? I do repurpose them for sure, but not in the way most people have repurposed them. I will, I will do my podcast thing. I do my podcast based on outlines. I don't interview guests. I just teach, right? So you go, you, you don't have a guest. You're talking direct to camera yeah. or, or, or to microphone or yeah, whatever. Direct to microphone. Um, you know, I, I try to, I try to have that just one-on-one -on -one connection with my audience. Um, I try to give them tremendous value. Uh, I try to check them every now and then. Uh, like I, I will get on the intro and say, hey, if you, last, if you listened to the last 50 episodes and done nothing with it, uh, then you need to check yourself, right? Because I, I do give a lot of value, but I don't want people to just get in the mode of, hey, I'm just going to sit and listen to Kevin and nod my head and not do anything. Um, like I want people to, to take action. And there's a fine line between that. Like if you give too much value, um, they'll either, you know, take it and go execute on it and never need you. Or they will sit and listen and nod their head and be like, man, this sounds great, but it's a lot of work and I don't want to do anything, right? Um, so I'm always trying to find that balance. But let's say I have an idea for a podcast episode. I'll do the podcast and then I will make it a video by recording from scratch the teaching again in a different way for the video. So it's the same topic a lot of the same content, but it's not just recording myself making the podcast and then uploading it to YouTube. I'm making it as a video. If, if I wasn't podcasting, this is what the video would look like. Oh, that's awesome. And how long are your average podcasts or YouTube videos? Uh, so most of my podcasts are over 15 minutes. They're going to be anywhere from 15 to 35 ish minutes. Uh, my videos tend to be 10 to 25 minutes. And let's talk about how you prepare to record. Like if you're going to go up against the, you know, you're alone in your office or wherever yeah. and you're going to do it like topic selection. Do you have like a little whiteboard that you kind of have ready to stay organized or something on your screen? Like what's your process? Yeah. So I have uh, an iPad that I just started using because the, so I, I bought an iPad a long time ago. I've had iPads the whole time. I've never found a use honestly, for iPad for business until, <laughs> until the Apple Pencil came out. The Apple okay. Pencil was a game changer for the iPad, in my opinion. Uh, so I use the Apple Pencil now for, because I like writing. Um, I type too much, so I hate typing. So when I'm doing you know, outlines, when I'm doing notes, when I'm recording ideas down, I like to write that stuff. And now the Apple Pencil lets me do all of that in an iPad. And so I, you know, like everybody have ideas for podcast episodes or videos throughout the day. And so I have a giant catalog of ideas, right? And then I, when I'm like, all right, we need a, a podcast for this week. And, you know, different from many podcasters, I don't record a big like chunk and then they're all scheduled. Every week I sit down and I'm like, all right, here's what I've been hearing. Here's what I've been seeing in my audience and this and that. What's the best podcast for them this week? And so I'll go into my big ideas list and if one hits the nail on the head, I pull it out, I outline it real quick and then I go record that podcast. Now recording that podcast is like a warm up, right? It like everything's in my head, the way that it's going, the way that it needs to go. Sometimes I make a mistake in the podcast that then when I do the YouTube video, I can make sure that that's included. Uh, but the outline's done. I've already presented it once. Now I flip on the camera and I do it for the camera in a, in a different way. And if I need to add things that can't be included in a podcast, like let's show a screen while we do this, right? Um, then I add that as well. That's cool. So what, uh, are, you, are you ever creating video with the, the Apple Pencil? Like are you drawing diagrams? Yes. Uh -huh, for sure. Now I don't, I don't know how many are, there's definitely in trainings that I've done in the Hive, I've done that. 
There are videos like if you go to my YouTube now, you'll see me do whiteboarding stuff, but I'm doing them with a pencil on my computer or my mouse on the computer. And so I'm just drawing with the mouse and it looks terrible. Um, that those happened before the, I figured out how to connect the iPad to the screen and record it and all of that stuff. Uh, cause there's a little tech involved there. That's, you know, it's not super easy. Are you recording in ScreenFlow or on? Yeah. Okay. No, in a, it's a Camtasia. On your okay, iPad? So no. Um, so I hook up the iPad to the computer. Yeah. And then Camtasia allows you to select the iPad as the screen. And oh. then you just open the Notability app and you start drawing and Camtasia is recording it for you. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, you made it to the, to the lightning round, Kevin. I want to congratulate okay. you on that. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. sharing so much great <laughs> knowledge. I can tell you got a lot of it. So I'm going to try to mine as much as I can for the course creators who are listening out there. Um, you've been through, you've made the transition from like day job, main street, brick and mortar business into the online world. And then you continue to like refine and adapt and grow. Like even just this thing about the iPad and the pencil uh, versus the trackpad or whatever and trying to use on the screen. Um, what, what are some influences that influence you, whether people or books or whatever that like kind of helped you? Like, I, I know you got a lot going on, but I know you got some ideas and some wisdom from others, YouTuber, whoever it was, like, Who's hel who helped you, whose ideas helped you kind of cross successfully? Yeah, I think, you know, when I think about um, books and I think about YouTube and I think about podcasts and if I had to narrow it down to one person, I don't think it would be a book. Um, and it wouldn't really be somebody who conveyed like information to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I've, I've drawn uh, lessons and tactics and strategies from dozens of books and dozens of podcasts and dozens of YouTube channels. But I think the first person who really made everything feel possible to me was Pat Flynn. Okay. Um, I know he gets mentioned all the time, but he, he's the, he, you can see why I identify with him, right? Regular guy, dad, entrepreneur, like not flashy. He's not, you know, putting cars and giant houses and boats all over his Instagram and all this other stuff, just like a normal guy. Right. And then he was releasing way back when, I don't think he does it anymore, uh, income reports. And I watched his progression back in the early days. And so it was just like, you always need somebody. I think when you are wondering, is it possible to do this thing? You need somebody to show you that you relate to that it is possible. And a lot of people in the online business world aren't relatable to me. When I look at their Instagrams, when I look at their videos on YouTube, they're not relatable, you know? Uh, like the one thing I hate the most is, uh, you know, people who are 23 with no kids releasing like, here's how to have your most productive day. Like, you know, here's my morning routine. And I'm like, you, you have no distractions. How could you not right. have the best morning routine ever, right? Like, it's not relatable. Um, and then people, you know, I, I don't want fancy cars. I don't want mansions. I don't want, I just, I just want freedom from this shitty job that I have. Can I just get that? Can we start there? Um, so Pat Flynn was like the first relatable person who, for me, it was like, this is possible, right? It, when Pat says, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I believe him, right? Yeah. And so that was my, I think, biggest inspiration. Yeah, I think he definitely inspired me. He's inspired a lot. And he, he continues to just do the same thing and keep doubling down on what he does yeah. well. And I see, I think this is his podcast player on your website. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. What's that called? Uh, the Smart Podcast Player, I think. And where do you host your podcast? Uh, fireside.fm. Okay. And how hard was that? Like, it? what? I have, have not heard, heard of that it? one, but I'm open. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I, I switched to them, be, honestly, because of the stats. Uh, they have really, really robust stats. Uh, and for, for me, when I was with Libsyn, well, first of all, I, I like using uh, beautiful software. Uh, Libsyn felt to me like I was stuck in like 1998 all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then I didn't want to go to Blueberry uh, or whatever it's called, however you pronounce it. Uh, and I came across Fireside in like an online forum and people were like, oh, yeah, this is fantastic. I mean, a podcast host is a podcast host. But when you have really robust stats, which is tough with podcasting is to get accurate, robust stats. Uh, Fireside kind of sealed the deal for me there. 
That's cool. I don't know if you noticed, but I just noticed last week that podcasts, like playable podcasts, are starting to show up in the Google search results, like directly. Oh, that's good. I heard that was coming, but yeah, (laughs) that's good to hear that it's out in the wild. Yeah, yeah. It's. I just noticed that, so I think that's cool. Uh, What? What's like the essential tech for YouTube? Like, I know people get like I see because the people who watch this are course creators, people who are building training-based membership sites, or they want to. Uh, and the video rabbit hole, like it, it takes people, there's people stuck, stuck, still stuck there. But if you were to advise a digital entrepreneur who's going to start with a YouTube channel or whatever, like what's, what's the basic tech stack? So for me, and, and I've, you know, because I'm a perfectionist and because, you know, I've been, and I also, by the way, have photography experience for very long time, just doing it for myself. Right. Like, you know, 14, 15 years of photography experience. Um, so I'm not new to cameras and things like that. And I've, you know, answered a lot of questions. Oh, what's the best camera for a beginner and stuff like that. Um, but I used to take my, I had a Canon 5D Mark II from photography, right? And I tried to use that initially for videos. Huge mistake. You can't yeah. see the screen. You, ha- you can't focus on yourself. Like, so the setup and just getting something usable out the door, it was an absolute nightmare. And it made me want to quit like back in the early days of doing video. So what I would say is the best tech stack for entrepreneurs who want to be on video, need to do courses or YouTube or whatever, get whatever camera you're comfortable with that has a flip around screen and good autofocus, like face detection autofocus. So you can just literally turn it on and it focuses on your face and you don't have to mess with all of the controls or anything like that, right? It's got to have an external microphone input. Um, I use a shotgun mic and I have a little boom stand that sticks right over my head so you can't see it in the camera frame. Um, that goes back to a uh, the, the audio recorder. I forgot what it's called, the H5, the Zoom, the Zoom H5. So that sits on top of my camera. So the big mic goes into that. That goes into the camera itself. The other thing I learned is I do not want to mess with matching up audio and video that yeah. the audio has to run directly into the camera feed or I'm not doing it because it's too much work. Right. Uh, and too much room for error as well. So microphone straight into the camera and then do as light editing as possible. Don't get sucked into the world of very detailed high end editing, just record. And my recording process is very simple. Um, I, I present to the camera like I'm presenting to people in the room or I feel like somebody is sitting across from me in the chair. If I screw up, I don't stop it and restart it. I just pause for a little bit and I just pick up where I left off and then I just look for pauses when I'm editing and just splice them out uh, and just make it super simple. Same thing with my podcast. So people ask me all the time, how much is your podcast editing time, your video editing time? So if I have a 30 minute podcast, I spend five minutes editing it and it's out the door. And with a video, same, same kind of process takes a little bit longer with a video, but I'm not sitting there meticulously editing stuff and adding a bunch of fancy slides and all this other nonsense. Like it's just content. Now let's get it out the door. Awesome. And final question real quick. Uh, you, one of the quickest ways digital entrepreneurs can kind of get out there and start marketing and getting leads is to actually leverage other people's audiences. Mm-hmm. You approach me, I have an audience of digital entrepreneurs Uh, you were prepared to add value to this podcast. What is your process and psychology around, you know, coming on somebody else's stage? Because sometimes we think we have to build this all from scratch, but you can actually work with other people too. So how did you, how does that work for you? So for me, it's, you know, uh, make people say no, you know, like a lot of people don't ask because they just decided that they're going to be told no before they even ask. Um, so the step one is just to ask. Now, a lot of times you're not going to get a response. Uh, and at that point you need to kind of go to the next level. All right. So if you want, really want to be on that show or network with that person in some way, and you don't get an initial response, go friend them on social media and go start interacting with their posts. Like you'll start showing up, like they'll kind of take notice of you, uh, engaging with their stuff. And over time that thing is going to develop. So don't be in a rush. Don't be pushy uh, and definitely don't sit on the sidelines going, well, they're probably not going to say yes. So I just won't ask. Like ask if you get a response. Great. Go from there. If you don't get a response, just connect with them and keep engaging and just be natural and develop an actual relationship. And then it'll work itself in over time. Awesome. 
Kevin Geary, thank you so much for coming on the show. You can find him at digitalambition.co and go check out his uh, his one page freedom plan. He's on version 3.0, at least of this recording, because yes. he's constantly improving. I'm constantly making it better. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show. Is there anywhere else people can connect with you besides digitalambition.co? That's it. Everything's there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And we'll see you around. Excellent. Thank you. And that's a wrap for this episode of LMS Cast. I'm your guide, Chris Badgett. I hope you enjoyed the show. This show was brought to you by Lifter LMS, the number one tool for creating, selling, and protecting engaging online courses to help you get more revenue, freedom, and impact in your life. Head on over to lifterlms.com and get the best gear for your course creator journey. Let's build the most engaging results getting courses on the internet.